Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Stephen was a boss who suits most of his subordinates. First and foremost, of course, was the paycheck. He not only paid people as much as he promised when they joined the firm, but everyone knew that in time, if it did not become a cashier, the line could count on a solid increase. There was a system of fines, but you had to seriously screw up to have some amount deducted from your income. Besides, the boss was not in the habit of humiliating those who worked for him, and overtime loads were always warned, and it was generously rewarded. But if not to abuse trust, the chief could always be asked off. One of the employees, who had a sick daughter for several months in a row, then and then broke down, then to take the child to take tests, then to pass a narrow specialist, then go to the procedures. But when the girl recovered, the mother went out of her way to do her job as best as possible and justify the trust. And finally, Stephen, although he was a middle-aged man, looked quite pleasant, slim, trim, smiling. Surprisingly, he was still unmarried, although he had had numerous affairs. Only once had he been frank and admitted that he had grown up in an orphanage so it was harder for him than others to start a family. He has no experience of living in one. The educators really wanted me to be adopted, he said, because I had good parents, young, intelligent geologists who worked as geologists and died in an expedition, and there were no relatives who were ready to take the child. But I came to the orphanage as an adult. I was 12 years old, and potential parents always look at babies, preferably even infants, so I was never anyone's first choice. And yet Stephen was a prime example that even a child from an orphanage can achieve a lot. He had a big house in the best part of the city, a successful company by the river, and a branch office ready to open. Needless to say, he had a magnificent car, a small but very comfortable yacht. Overseas travel novels at Stephen happened often, but did not end in anything serious. So the ladies knew from the start, they had nothing to count on. However, they were not offended. Generous friends showered them with gifts and kept good relations with all of them. The more the staff was interested in a non-standard situation, when a new employee Molly came to the staff. She was a very young girl. She had just turned 19 years old. She studied by correspondence and there were already several successful examples when the chief gave way to such young talents. As they say, put them on the wing. Molly was pretty with dark hair, huge eyes, and that nose. Her family was clearly not rich, and the staff had no doubt that the new girl would not last long. In a week, she would become the chief's new mistress. She was not even condemned, but quite understood. You have to feed yourself, girls. As long as she is not replaced by another girl, the chief's favor is guaranteed. But here's the amazing thing. Week after week, month after month, and no love story in sight. Although Stephen was clearly flirting with Molly, complimenting her, giving her signs of attention. But the girl behaved so restrained, responded to the chief with such deference that he felt Lennon. Does she really think he is so old that she does not even consider him as her boyfriend? But when it was time for the New Year's corporate party and the staff ordered a meal with delivery from the fanciest restaurant, Stephen still decided to break the resistance without touching. He made sure Molly tried a few cocktails himself. They were very pleasant to taste and yet strong. And then the chief invited the girl to his office. Supposedly he needed help with some paperwork persuaded her to have a broader shake of cognac. Then one of the ladies furtively pulled the cabinet handle and snidely informed the others it was locked. All the same, our Makel got to know the chief's comfy couch. When after a while the couple joined the others, it was clear that the inevitable had happened. The chief was extremely pleased, and Molly was as red as a peony and wouldn't look anyone in the eye. The corporate party turned out to be wonderful guest artists performed. The food was amazing, and the people stayed up late when they finally started to leave. The chief said that he would personally drive Molly home, and the girl saw a woman in the doorway, whom the guard didn't want to let in. Molly's mom was rushing to meet her. 
What took you so long? The woman said with a soft rebuke. I've been worried sick. I thought something was wrong. Finally, I couldn't stand it. I took a cab and came. The woman was dressed very modestly. Some shabby, artificial fur coat, boots, which in the market contemptuously called goodbye, youth, a white scarf. On the black-assed hair, Stephen gazed intently at the stranger and the review. Before them was Christina, the wife of his wayward friend Benjamin, with whom at one time he had been in love, and himself. Stephen had once had great difficulty adjusting to life in an orphanage. He grieved for his parents. He was a polite, sensitive, homely boy. He did not know how to stand up for his interests. Now he found himself in completely different conditions. The orphans took every opportunity to mock him, to take away something, to leave him hungry in the canteen. Stephen went so far that he cried at night from hunger and resentment. That's when he met Benjamin, who began to protect him. And even their fates were in some ways similar. Both were homesick, though Benjamin's life was so hard that he was hardly better off at home than in the state. Previously, he had lived in an old village house where Benjamin's mother's relatives and grandmother had gathered. Himself with his mother and numerous aunts unmarried, but fond of drinking. The house had fallen almost into disrepair. For many years, no one had neither money nor desire to bring it to the house. True, in the spring they dug a vegetable garden, planted vegetables, potatoes, onions, cabbage. We did it for practical reasons. If we had our own food, we had more money for vodka. Mother drank perhaps less than the others, but she had an irresistible urge to steal. As a little girl, she stole toys, brightly colored ribbons, and candy from her friends. When the girl became older, everyone knew Wendy better not to invite her into the house, or else something not to count. And when Benjamin went to first grade, his mother went to jail, stole a neighbor's pension she'd received the day before, threw a party at home. And when she didn't have enough money, she threatened another neighbor and demanded more money for booze. Maybe Wendy wouldn't have gotten jail time. But everyone who knew her just prayed that this thief couldn't live in the same village, lock her up somewhere for a few years. Benjamin was given to an orphanage. None of the aunts wanted custody of him. Each had their own reasons for not taking responsibility for the boy. One had an injury. One was out of work. The third one seemed to be going to the city. That's what the aunts told the officials, but they didn't dare tell Benjamin the truth. The boy clung to them, looked into their eyes, begged them to keep him. You'll live there for a while, and then we'll take you away. The aunts assured him, we'll get back on our feet and come and get you. There are lots of kids there, plenty of toys. They feed you well, teach you, clothe you, shoe you, just be patient. At first, Benjamin waited for the aunts to fulfill their promises. He was on duty at the window, ran to every doorbell. But the weeks passed, and Benjamin was not only not picked up, but not even visited. Then the nimble boy began to run home by himself, and as soon as he found his way, he hitchhiked home. He lied to drivers that he was going to his sick grandmother, and they gave him a ride. At home, his aunts and grandmother would grab their heads, they had to call the orphanage to get someone to come and take him back. What is it with you kids? Doesn't anyone watch them? If Benjamin ran away, the aunts were indignant. And the day came when the boy realized it was useless to hope that someone from the family would take him in. The aunts are lying to his eyes. He has to wait for his mother to get out of juvie. She'll take him back home. But Wendy, when she went out to get her son, didn't come back. She quickly got married and moved away. Then, rumor has it, she went back to prison. One way or another, Benjamin never saw her again. Wendy's parental rights were never revoked. Benjamin became bitter and had no more relations with any of his relatives. He now considered the orphanage his true home and began to settle in. Stephen did not know how Benjamin became friends with Christina. It happened before he himself got into the execution walls. It is known that the girl was an abandoned child. She was left at the maternity hospital by a young mother. Then the little girl was transferred to an orphanage, and then she went through all the paths on which such children go. 
Christina didn't know or even try to find out anything about her parents. She simply did not imagine any other life than in the state walls. She was the smallest and skinniest of the children who had joined the orphanage that year. Benjamin took pity on her as he would a stray and a kitten and took to protecting her. He made sure she didn't get food taken away from her in the cafeteria. If he himself got something tasty, he gave it to Christina. But that didn't happen very often. No one else dared lay a finger on the girl. And if she was offended by the teachers, with them invariably happened then something nasty. A slip on the stairs and something slippery, the least of which Benjamin Wine could not prove, though everyone realized it was him. In the end, even the most evil brought up, stopped saying little Christina unpleasant things. On the look of the girl was then quite unassuming. She followed Benjamin like a shadow. And so they had as if formed within the walls of the orphanage their own little family. Then Stephen joined it. He himself did not know why Benjamin took pity on him, but he punched Stephen several times so hard to offenders, got a little of his life in the execution walls, and then in the form of the highest form of trust allowed him to be friends with Christina. But as far as school was concerned, Benjamin took a back seat. Stephen had always been a good student. It's true that after his parents died, he dropped out of school for a while. But then he realized that now in life, he would have to make his own way and took up his mind again. He quickly became an excellent student at the school, where the children from the orphanage were studying. But since Stephen helped other kids and those who couldn't be helped, he let them cheat. He was not teased nerd, on the contrary, tried to make friends with him. This helped the boy to finally fit into the team. Christina, when she went to school, also turned out to be a capable girl. She did not shine in all subjects, but some sciences were given to her surprisingly well. She was sent to the Olympiads in Russian and English. The teacher advised Christina to go further in this field. Maybe a translator. Where can you get a job? Talking to foreigners. It'll start. You have a whole different life or at least get a job at a development center. Teach English to kids, you'll make good money. Christina didn't say yes or no. She wasn't talking at all. She still followed Benjamin. She was friendly with Stephen. But it wasn't until the eighth grade that she suddenly looked almost indecently beautiful. She became a real beauty. People were looking at her on the street, but she didn't need anyone but Benjamin. From that moment on, the boys from the orphanage began to fall in love with Christina. They would do anything for her, and now not only Benjamin, but Stephen protected the girl from admirers who were ready for her to walk obediently or jump from the second floor. And Benjamin started stealing. Mother's blood in him, after all. He got in touch with some scumbags who would clean kiosks, steal a passerby's purse, or cut off a girl's purse from her shoulder and Benjamin himself doesn't seem to have done anything. Needed his share of the stolen goods. He used it to pamper Christina. He bought her chocolates and little things, nooks and crannies, perfume, shoes. What was going on at the orphanage back then? Christina, perfectly aware of where everything came from, was terribly afraid for Benjamin. She cried and said she didn't need any of it. The stuff she couldn't throw away. It was from the hen, but she tried to hide it so the caretakers wouldn't notice. And they almost always noticed anyway. You realize we're covering for you. We don't report you where we should. They reported you to Benjamin because they'll lock you up like your mother. Then you'll be completely lost. We're waiting for you to come to your senses. Otherwise you'll go to jail for a long time. And Christina will find another guy. Benjamin looked gloomily at his girlfriend, but she only shook her head. She didn't want anyone else. Benjamin. Really? Stephen tried to influence his friend. We only have a little time left in school. Soon we'll start earning our own money. Then you'll be free to go. You've got good hands. You won't be out of work. By the way, the golden pen was a thief. Looks like Benjamin was cooking. And my hands are golden in the sense that gold sticks to them. Christina brought in some earrings the other day and it's not hard to hide. She's gonna get out of here and wear them. 
All that was left was to wave goodbye. But Stephen tried to convince Christina. With Benjamin, you'll get nowhere, he said. You can't depend on him. And if you marry him, he won't change. But Christina couldn't be persuaded. If it wasn't for Benjamin, I might not even be alive anymore. She said, you know, you know, some old ladies are mean, how they mock the younger ones. And I couldn't fight back. If Benjamin hadn't stood up for me, I'd have been hounded. Well, it's understandable that you're grateful to him. But messing with someone like him is a lifelong commitment. You're capable, talented. You'll get an education if you want to thank him later. You'll have money and opportunities. Is such things measured in money? Christina objected. And what you're saying now, is it decent? He's your friend and you're messing around with his girlfriend. Was I embarrassed? Stephen, I think I want you to do what's best for you. I love him, I just objected. But as it goes, so it goes. And I can't do without him anyway. To Christina's credit, it must be said that she never told Benjamin about the conversations Stephen had with her. And the young people's friendship remained strong until graduation. Shortly before the exams, two things happened. Benjamin stole another kiosk to celebrate the parting with friends. He was well aware that their roads would be further apart. And although he had promised his friends 100 times to stop stealing, this time they did not reproach him. They snuck out the window and spent the whole May night in the park. Christina and Stephen drank champagne. They ate expensive chocolates, and Benjamin topped himself up with vodka. Did they discuss plans? Stephen was going to go to a technical university. He had every chance of getting in. No one, neither teachers nor comrades doubted that he would pass the exams well. Have you decided where you will go? He asked Benjamin. He looked regretfully at the bottle, which had little left in it. And to the 30, he said. It was the former vocational school number 30, which was still not called 30 in the city, although now the school had the proud status of a lyceum. It was still possible to learn to be a bricklayer, plasterer, painter, and other working professions on the list. All the kids in the orphanage went to school there. A few years ago, Benjamin Sturhan's class took a field trip there. It was called Career Guidance. The foreman who took them around the classrooms and workshops whispered to someone, winked at them, and at the end of the event, they were taken to the canteen. Everyone remembered sweet still warm buns and surprisingly tasty apple kissel for a long time. Stephen suspected that the good food was what had inclined Benjamin to choose the school. But where are you going? He asked Christina affectionately. I thought you were going to be an elementary school teacher. In the teacher's college, Christina would pass by all means, and they're a dormitory, although small, but the scholarship and the opportunity to quickly get a specialty with which you will definitely not be unemployed. In addition, Christina has always loved kids. In the shower, Stephen hoped that the couple in love would share life itself. Schools at different ends of the city, each would have his own company, his own responsibilities. But Christina and Benjamin just looked at each other. I'm not going anywhere now, Christina said. Pregnant, Stephen's jaw dropped. He knew, of course, that the orphanage girls were not childishly spinning a romance from their childhood years. But for some reason he thought Christina was different. He dreamed that someday he would take her to the registry office in a white dress, innocent and in love. Christina, however, had already thought of everything. And there was no doubt about that with Benjamin. It would be up to her to think and decide. I talked to the teacher, she began, looking at Sophia's intertwined fingers. She started early too, she said she couldn't bear it. We have to get on our feet first, but then she said nothing to the others. We decided to have a wedding in our dining room at the same time as graduation. But it's a secret for now, you're the first one we're telling. She's a chemistry teacher, her daughter just got married. She's got a dress hanging at home. She'll bring it so it'll be real. Tell me, what about getting married in a church? Laughing Benjamin. Christina smiled and shook her head negatively. And with housing, everything will be solved too. Benjamin's survivor's pension all these years went on the book. Will it be enough for any room? 
maybe even an isolated small family. I looked at the ad. We'll take the cheapest one we can find. We'll have time to renovate before the baby's born. Stephen bit his lip, and he only finds out about everything now, when his friends have already decided everything. Not that they'd kept it from him on purpose, it's just that they probably didn't think it was any of his business, so they didn't see fit to share it before. So the farewell in the park, which Benjamin had intended as a joke, turned out to be the real thing. In the days they were still to spend at the orphanage, Stephen saw his friends much less often. He pretended that he was immersed in books and studying hard for his exams. In reality, he just hated seeing Christina and Benjamin. He realized that they were both innocent, but at the same time, he felt in his heart that they had betrayed him. They felt something and tried not to impose themselves. They had no time to go to so much trouble before the wedding. But Stephen didn't go to the graduation or the wedding. He agreed that the director gave him his certificate earlier than everyone else and without any solemn ceremonies. The following days, he consoled himself with the fact that he had only two fours, the rest of the A's. That his orphanage buddy had gone to school to become a plumber and bought a shabby family. In the oldest neighborhood in the city, and Stephen has a survivor's pension too. A good one. And he still had his parents' apartment which they rented out while he lived in the orphanage. This also brought a considerable amount of money into the account. Was there something to start life with? In the uni, Stephen passed with ease, bought his first car, and swore to himself that he would definitely spin out. He plunged into his studies, as they call it, with his head, and soon stood out among his classmates. But most of all, Stephen was eager to get acquainted, to look around, to see where he should go after graduation. That's what he needed most of all. He defended himself with a red diploma and got a place in a very promising company. The program even included overseas internships, if Stephen wanted to. With his abilities and diligence, he would probably become no less than a deputy director, but he himself did not wish it. And after a few years, having gained experience, he started his own firm. He had to start all over again, only to work with 10 men against the former. But Stephen, clenching his teeth, did not give up. In his apartment, he appeared only late at night and then for four hours to sleep. He recalled later that once he was so tired that he fell asleep in the corridor on a bench when he took off his shoes. In the morning, he woke up, put on his shoes and hurried downstairs. He was already late for a client meeting but there was more than just working with maximum dedication. Gradually, the money was coming in as well. He began to allow himself things he'd never dreamed of before. Not only while living in the orphanage, but also before, when his parents were still alive. Vacationing in foreign resorts every time he discovered a new country. Favorite restaurants, which he now visited regularly club, where he had friends, and of course, women he found them without difficulty. After all, he was young, good-looking, charming, and becoming more and more wealthy. With his former buddies he did not meet, there was neither time nor desire, but he did not let them out of his sight completely. He knew that Benjamin was drinking more and more, and Christina gave birth to a boy. The baby was born prematurely and had some kind of abnormality. Instead of breast milk, he needs a special expensive formula, which of course, there's no money for. Stephen has his assistant get an address for Christina and her husband. And since the couple had no bank cards, he sent Christina a money order. Knowing her character, he assumed that she could return the entire amount, although she was in dire need of it. Therefore, the transfer was practically anonymous. From an addressee with an unfamiliar surname, with a note from a distant relative. Thank God Christina accepted the money. She must have been under a lot of pressure. Two years later, the couple had a second son. Benjamin worked wherever he could. His hands were really good. He was willingly hired, but not until the next binge. So soon he stopped looking for a place in his hometown. The notoriety ran ahead of him. Now he went to work somewhere far away, then to Siberia, then to the north, then to the far east. Sometimes he brought back good money, 
and sometimes he disappeared. And then Christina had to look for him, call and write to anyone she could to get a trace of him. It was especially hard for her. If the children were sick or something else happened that required an urgent investment of money, and yet a miracle happened in Christina's life. She really found a distant relative, who at one time and insisted that the young mother signed a waiver of the baby. Where now was this mother? No one could say Nancy found Christina. She herself lived in another city. Couldn't make it. She was very sick. Almost never got out of bed. And she didn't want to see her. The woman felt she didn't have long to live and only wanted to clear her conscience. A little redemption. Maybe if Vanessa had taken you in, she would have come to her senses, Nancy said over the phone. But I thought at the time that she couldn't handle the baby, that it would be on us, the family. And what did we do to deserve such a burden? I've had bad legs for years. It's not even easy for me to look after myself. Vanessa, my mom's remarried. She can't take care of her granddaughter. So I said to Vanessa, give her to the state and the orphanage. They will bring her up better than you will. Now I thought it would be possible to accept Christina in the family. And if not, at least visit her at the orphanage. It's not human to do that from time to time. Abandoned the child and forgotten. That's what my son said. I'll bequeath him the apartment and the money I managed to put aside. And you a summer house. It's abandoned, but it's a nice place. My son doesn't go there and doesn't want to sell it. He's not very practical. He grew up with me. So in my will, I'll describe the cottage. So in my will, I'll leave the cottage to you. I don't want anything from you. Christina was confused. I've never even seen you. You don't owe me anything. It will be easier for me to go to the other world, said Nancy. If I know that I took care of you in some way. So if you want to sell the cottage, if you want to bring it up to date and take the children there for the summer, it's up to you. In short, I warned you not to be too surprised when you get your inheritance. Why don't you two live a little longer? Don't get your hopes up, you cut me off. But God grant you happiness. I'm sorry, what's my fault? With these words, she hung up the phone and Christina could not recover from the strange conversation for a long time. Meanwhile, the last time Benjamin managed to earn very well, Christina had already got a job by this time. She never managed to finish teacher training school. No, she didn't. She dreamed of working in a library, but it was a utopia. If she was hired without special education, she would get very little. And Christina realized that the times when she became the main breadwinner of a small family would be repeated more and more often. The boys are growing up, they need more and more. And she got a job as a kitchen worker in the city health center, dragged heavy barrels, tray, pots, peeled vegetables. But she always brought home some food in a pot, so I could even save part of my paycheck. How did you decide to give birth in such poverty? Comrades wondered. And two more. Wasn't it wise to wait until you got back on your feet? You can't choose your times. Christina said quietly, so you're also cultured. Why doesn't your husband take pity on you? He sent you to the worst job in the world. He didn't. Benjamin, however, did not insist on Christina working so hard. He'd just give her the money she earned, not forgetting to keep some for himself, and he'd settle down. When would he get his next paycheck? And would Christina have enough with the boys? Until then, it didn't bother him. But for six months, he'd been bringing good money back from the north. And Christina made up her mind. Let's sell the room, she told her husband. Add what you've earned. At the very least, we'll take out a small loan and buy a bigger place. What is this? The four of us in 15 meters. The second room was occupied by a military wife. He had a child of his own growing up. There were often quarrels between the boys. The women didn't always get along in the kitchen either. The military family had moved in even earlier. That's why both husband and wife felt they were the masters. They didn't like Benjamin drinking and talking loudly when he was home. Turns the TV on full blast. Christina, who grew up in an orphanage, was not a perfect hostess either, 
and the military wife often reprimanded her for escaped borscht or pasta stuck in the drains, sinks, and pasta. Maybe we'll even have enough for a two-room apartment. You wish, Christina. Even if it was in any condition with fights, wallpaper, a dead push. I'd bring her home anyway, as long as I had my own place. Beginning of New Year holidays and very fortunate was the proposal Christina to work in the countryside year-round in a children's camp. On vacations there were a lot of children, and in the kitchen labor was in short supply. The most important thing was that Christina could go there with the boys. They'd get a room for everyone and free food. And you will sell our place in the meantime. She admonished her husband. The room is in your name, so you'll have to sign the papers anyway. Be careful and don't drink, please, when you find buyers. Call me. I'll see what they're offering you. The New Year holidays flew by in a flash. The vacations that followed also flew by like a blink of an eye. Although the Christina children were still young, they enjoyed walking in the winter woods, exploring the playground, sliding down the slides in the evenings. Christina would bring a big bowl of hot rolls, sprinkle them with sugar, and the kids would fly them away, watched cartoons. What could be better than that? Finally, when the people began to disperse, Christina saw her husband at the gate of the camp. It alarmed her at once. Why didn't he call, but came right away? And why did he look so strange, averting his eyes? Of course, with Benjamin one could always expect anything. But Christina was frightened in advance. What's wrong? Shouted out, before she could even run up to her husband. Do you understand? He continued to look away. It's this kind of thing. What's the matter? You can tell me I've been offered a good deal, but I think I'm in trouble. Christina slumped exhausted on a snow-covered bench. It turned out that Benjamin was his best friends, whom he knew so well from his work up north. They offered to trade him a room, but a cool foreign car. You sign a deed of gift for us, and tomorrow we'll race you the car and go to draw up all the documents for it. The car was shown in a photograph. It looked very presentable. And although Benjamin could not drive and did not know the brands, he was convinced that the exchange for him will be the most favorable. You will resell it in no time. The buddies assured him. She is worth three times more than your villain with hands will tear off. And then you'll have no problem buying an apartment. See for yourself. You can sell a room like yours for six months. There's no conditions, no repairs, and we check everything in a matter of days. It's a rare surprise for you. Benjamin finally fell for it and signed the deed of gift. Christina and the kids were registered at a different address. They decided to do it in advance to make the sale quicker and easier. And now it's played against them. The room went into the hands of Benjamin, their friends, no car. And the next day, naturally, the guy didn't get one. He waited for 24 hours. Others on the third with difficulty got through to one of the men. I'm sorry, dear. It's such a nuisance. He began to justify himself. The car had an accident and is being repaired. What about it? Benjamin was confused. My guys are coming back soon. Where would they go? Let's cancel the deed of gift. Don't worry. He'll fix your car up good as new. There's no way to cancel the deed. We've already bought your room. He's a very serious man. You better not argue with him, or they'll put you on the knife. It all seemed like a bad dream. Benjamin ran to his old address. The military wife, who had hated him before, literally clung to him. Benjamin, what have you done? The perfect thug and his family moved in. I'm walking through a wall now. Even my husband can't say a word to him. You can't get protection from the state yet. He won't even think about it. He'll just cut him and that's it. Benjamin, come back. Cancel the deal. I won't say another word against you. Not to you or your wife. So what do we do now? It was the first time she'd ever seen her husband so confused. Should we go to a lawyer or something? You're smart. Give me a hint. You've ruined my life. Christina said quietly. Stephen told me right then, no matter how much I fight with you, 
It's all for nothing with this untimely pregnancy. You robbed me of my future. I could have gone to school and done something with my life. And when children were born. And so it went. Why do you see everything black? Benjamin said angrily. His wife had reproached him for almost the first time in his life. And he didn't like it. Have we lived so badly with you? Another man wouldn't earn as much as I brought you. Sometimes you agreed, and then nothing for six months. I moved from place to place, or a job worthy of you did not turn out, or friends cheated. Like now they got money from the customer for all of them, and divided it among themselves, and they told you if the customer was a scoundrel who didn't pay. I know these cases, I called them. They don't tell you anything to the people you worked for. Everything was paid to the penny. Only Tabakov's earring has that money stuck to his hands, and when his son Dimka asked you to take a loan for a week until payday, you took it out on yourself, believing that Dimka would pay the money himself. But he couldn't fool a fool like you. He forgot the loan to his brother, how much 90,000 there was. They wouldn't have allowed you to put the room on the market with the bank debt. I'm the one who paid it off. Benjamin was living at the door, while you were up north, cleaning out dumpsters. Cool, yeah, I was gonna lend books to libraries. I wanted to go to theaters, meet cultured people. Benjamin took offense. So you think I'm a physical therapist? Yeah. You were only good when you were brought to the orphanage alive. Frozen. And everyone was trying to slap you around. I remember that. Christina looked him straight in the eye. That's why I put up with it for so long and never said anything to you, never reproached you with anything. And now you don't want to put up with it anymore. Well, look for a cultured man who will take you to the theaters. Benjamin put his hands in his pockets and walked away without looking back. He even seemed to be booed. Christina realized that she had deeply hurt his manhood, knew too that he was going nowhere, that he might not have a place to sleep tonight. On the other hand, he hadn't asked where she and the kids would go from here from camp either. For a few days, Christina could have stayed with some of her friends, but now there was uncertainty ahead, and you can't burden strangers with your family for too long, especially when you have children. That's when she remembered about the aunt for luck, and realized that she seemed to have no other way out. Her aunt said that her husband had once built a house so that she could live in it in winter. There's a stove or something. According to the owner's plan, the family was to spend New Year's and Christmas at the cottage. The nature around is gorgeous. The last days she could spend in the camp. Christina asked another kitchen worker to look after her boys and went for a reconnaissance. The news was both bad and good. The cabin was in disrepair and it was a long walk to the nearest store. None of the neighbors were staying there for the winter. And this silence around was frightening. What if there was an unkind person nearby, and there was no one to call for help? On the other hand, the house had two rooms and a kitchen. There was no stove, but the dacha had light, heaters, the most necessary furniture, and even a small stock of food. Christina decided to take a risk. All day she cleaned the cabin, as she could make it cozy, and then brought the boys here. They were delighted when they realized the situation. So now they have their own house. In the garden you can sculpt a snowman, build your own slide, and no angry neighbors nearby. Now no one will constantly scold them, demanding that they do not run and make noise. Christina had a little money set aside, but she realized that she would not be able to live on this amount for long. Knowing Benjamin's character, she had no doubt that there was no help from him. Alimony what kind of alimony? if he officially does not work anywhere and travels to all sorts of coven. She had the idea to go to the very girl for whom she paid the loan. It was very convenient for him to just forget about the debt. But Christina knew that with a probability of almost 100% she would not achieve anything. According to rumors, Damashka lived with a girl who fully supported him. He himself preferred to lie on the couch and not work. He'd say fuck you. If your husband's such a sucker, why did he believe me? It's not my fault. And several evenings in a row Christina until late at night sat near the boys and thought, thought her sons were open to her joke. 
Though the laughter was artificial, it was warmer. Christina was terribly afraid of catching the boy's cold. How to treat in such conditions? It is impossible to call a doctor. In the end, there was another kind soul who agreed to look after the children. And Christina went to the city to see if she could count on a remote job. The last years she learned to do needlework quite well, sewing and knitting toys. Unusual, original, colorful. From her more than once bought kittens, puppies, a pony, and a dragon. The earnings, of course, tiny, but still. Christina knew a store that sold handmade products. Here came those who were tired of consumer goods and wanted something special. The negotiations with the owner were successful. Christina showed her pictures of her toys. She left a few animals. She wanted to go shopping for cheaper groceries, even though she knew she'd have to carry a heavy bag a long way. And she couldn't believe her eyes when she saw Stephen. She never thought she could run into him like that on the street. If she hadn't known him so well, she probably would have passed him by. Nothing else gave him away as a former orphanage boy who was happy just to have a piece of bread. An expensive coat, a groomed look. He came out of some institution on the main street. Christina hesitated for a moment, then caught up with the man and touched his sleeve. Stephen, is that you? He recognized her at once. Though she realized she didn't look like much. Haggard, probably age, no makeup. Only her lips were painted with cheap red lipstick, so as not to look pathetic. But Stephen was genuinely pleased. There was no doubt about that. He bombarded her with questions. How she was here, and how long had she come alone or with her family, and how were she and Benjamin doing? Christina made no secret of it and told him that they were probably separated for good. She had never seen Stephen so excited. He suggested we sit somewhere and talk because you're going to lose your son again for 1,000 years, and I won't know where to find you. Christina looked at her watch and thought she would catch the last train. She had always felt so safe and secure with Stephen. Maybe now he could give her some good advice. He led her to a small, elegant restaurant and very tactfully placed her order. He realized that Christina would look at the menu with the French names of the dishes, about the way a goat would study a new gate, and they started with wine. Christina drank her glass in one gulp. She just wanted to calm down, that this was high-end ice cream, wine and pleasure was supposed to stretch. It hadn't even occurred to her. Sturhan didn't say much about himself. He only mentioned that his business was fine. He came here on a business trip, married. Christina asked him straight out. She thought that someone might see her and Stephen. And if an old friend had a family, he could be in trouble. No, he shook his head with a sad smile. I haven't fallen in love with anyone yet. Why would I want a loveless marriage? I can have fun without a stamp in my passport. But Stephen asked about everything in detail and the wine loosened her tongue. Benjamin left his kids outside in the winter, you know. He didn't even ask us where we were going or look for us. If he'd been running around my girlfriends, they'd have told me. No, he doesn't care. He was always sure I'd get my family out of any trouble and the kids wouldn't be lost with me. I warned you. I quietly told Stephen this would happen. That's the way it is, not the other way around. Now I have to get down on my knees and apologize to you. Steriani, you were right. I was wrong. I was stupid. Only now it's too late. And you'll do something. Stephen asked. I'll plant a vegetable garden till spring. I'll feed myself somehow. Maybe work on David's dacha at home. I'll sell it. And me and the boys will move back to the city in some room. Where will you go at night now? Stephen said thoughtfully. There's someone to look after the children till morning. Let's go and spend the night. What am I in the hotel? Christina inwardly aghast at the surprise of this proposal and for the first time in her life waved at everything. And she was not. She called an acquaintance who was watching the children and said she would come in the morning. The acquaintance was a young girl, a student. She could stay the night at the cottage. Christina said they would pay her double. At first, Stephen tried to play the selfless friend, who was ready to give Christina his bed in the hotel suite, 
and himself to sleep on the sofa. But they woke up together in Kane's ice's wide bed. Stephen thought Christina was still asleep, and she was watching him from under the floor cover. By now she knew for certain that she didn't love Stephen, and could never love him. Even now Benjamin worried her more. Meanwhile, Stephen had pulled several large bills from his wallet and quietly placed them in Christina's purse. It was enough to still challenge her with shame and hatred for him. She had been paid for a night of lovemaking as a person of easy behavior. Just as Stephen disappeared into the shower and the sound of running water was heard, Christina slipped out of the room. She was in such a hurry that she put on her coat and boots in the hallway. He wouldn't find her there and he wouldn't even think of looking for her. If her own father did not dare to come to them even once, although theoretically he knew where the dacha was. At home Christina appeared immensely guilty, immediately let the assistant go, paying her more than enough. And all day long she fiddled with the boys. Then there were a few very different days when all three of them, but they kept their heads down. Christina sewed her own bears or seeds. She told the boys stories, and thought about the fact that if she had to winter here another winter, the house would have to be insulated for sure. She didn't feel well, but she put it down to depression. She wanted to lie down and cry. Christina kept thinking about how tired she was of the vicissitudes of life, how mercilessly fate had treated her, exactly all the time tested for strength. Others had it so hard, much easier. She had never had a chance to get a grip, to get out of poverty. Christina lay with her back turned to the wall. Her eyes were closed and tears were streaming down her cheeks. Mom, why do you sleep all the time? Her eldest son John was rubbing her. What do you want? Christopher and I want to eat. Christina forced herself to get up. Boiled potatoes in a jacket pot. Chopped finely onions poured lean butter or fry pancakes. It was their usual meal. If the boys were not hungry, they did not pester her. They felt something. Did Christina eat? She didn't feel like eating. And she only drank tea, trying to save not more than one spoonful of Sahara in a cup. Her sons didn't recognize unsweetened tea. And the store was far away. And she didn't want to go there at all. But if we run out, we'll have to. Benjamin found them and came back empty-handed. And hungry, he didn't bring the boys anything, not even caramels. But his son still hung on to him. Benjamin smiled confusedly. Of course, he didn't solve the problem or even try. He wondered if Christina was still mad at him. And maybe she had thought of something herself. Mom, let Dad eat. John took off like a rocket and carried everything back to his father's. I had to cook pasta on the stove. Where do you live? In a neutral voice, Christina asked, while Benjamin ate. He shrugged, not lifting his eyes from his plate. When at your friends, how can they stand your drinking? When I just sleep in the entrance, he continued, one or the other, because they're already chasing me out of there. He grinned. Christina offered to have fun with that too. Would you go to your north? She said tiredly. There you'll find a place in a wagon but you won't go hungry. You told me that the watchmen eat in a bargain and pour you a bowl of soup. You just want me to earn money for the apartment faster. That's why you're hounding me. No, I shook my head. I don't need your money anymore. They don't bring happiness. They take it away. Benjamin was quiet. For a few seconds, Christina, forgive me, he said at last. You could see how hard it was for him to say those words. Men hate to apologize, to admit they're wrong. There is even an anecdote about a man who seemed to say sorry, but actually said sheet. But Benjamin was silent, so he really did apologize in front of her. You'll ask your sons for forgiveness when they're older, Christina said, for leaving them homeless. I don't want anything from you. You despise me, pulling away. She devoted herself by the elbows, just like shutting yourself off from him. Live your life as you wish, be happy if you can, but don't you dare ruin my life again. I'll get my kids back on their feet. What about you, Benjamin, looking around at more kitchens? This is where you'll live. Maybe I can stay with you too, but until spring, but not for long. 
I don't really have anywhere to live. My friends are boring the hell out of me. No jobs come up yet. I could be useful here. Shoveling snow after all. Insulate the house or something. You know I can do anything. Yeah, she said slowly. You can do anything. His plate was already empty. Christina went to the door and opened it. Go. She was small and thin compared to him. But he didn't dare to contradict her. He never took off his jacket. It was cold in the house. He pulled up the zipper signal and put on Christina's hat. But if anything, you'll need it from outside. You know the number. Still got the phone. Strangely left the Sam card, he admitted. I'll get rich and buy a new phone. And myself. And the boys. Go, she repeated and locked the door behind him. She was sure she was afraid he might come back, shutting him out like an enemy. And a few days later, Christina realized she was pregnant and was challenged by terror. She didn't wonder who the child was from, Benjamin or Stephen. She'd lost both of them anyway. And she wouldn't connect her life with either of them. But what was she to do now? She realized that she would give birth to this baby and pull it with all her might. But would it be enough? Had the orphanage changed something in her? Now she couldn't deny anyone the right to live. If a wasp flew into the room, Christina would pick it up with a toppled towel and throw it out the window, watching the wasp fly away. She would never step on a bug that knew the way. It was sentimentality on the verge of idiocy. But though life had toughened her up, she couldn't do it any other way. Now had to walk to town almost every day. Though like almost every pregnant Christina wanted to lie down and doze. Instead, she looked for buyers for the doctor, found out prices for housing, and here she was lucky almost for the first time in her life, offered an exchange for a house with a plot. Christina received a one-bedroom, let on the outskirts, let the apartment had to be brought to mind. But the young woman almost did not cry from happiness. We got the apartment from my grandmother. They told my wife to sign the documents. We wouldn't live there anyway. And in such a neighborhood you can't rent it for a decent sum. And your cottage has such a wonderful place. The forest is close to the river. We'll use the cabin as a time. And we'll start building ourselves. Christina hurriedly signed the papers the notary gave her. She was afraid that everything would be taken away from her. But nothing was taken away, on the contrary, everything was left. Even the furniture. Christina perceived it as happiness. After all, not so long ago she had nothing of her own. And now she had a sideboard with dishes. And a round table covered with a knitted tablecloth. A bed for her and a sofa for the boys. And in the closet even an old linen stack. No, spouses who gave up such wealth were truly crazy. The lucky streak continued. Christina went to the family services office, just to see if she'd get anything with three kids. Every penny was now a penny's worth, and they offered her a job. They were all over her at the Children's Rehabilitation Center. They needed a night nurse. No one agreed to spend the nights constantly looking after other people's children. Nannies agreed to night duty reluctantly, almost scandalously, and Christina had the same tears of gratitude to fate. It's not like carrying heavy cans in the kitchen. She surprisingly came to this job and often thought about how lucky the children in the rehabilitation center. Compared to those kids who went straight to boarding schools, the small building, converted from a former kindergarten, was cozy and warm. The groups were small, and in the rooms the pupils lived two by two. They were fed to their heart's content and tasted good. Macinus constantly gave something to the center, then toys, then new fluffy, huge carpet in the game room, then a big TV, a real movie theater. But the fates of the children remained the same as many years ago. And this girl was left alone, because she has only her mother, and she is being treated for tuberculosis, probably will not recover. The little brother has a sister and his parents are drug addicts who abandoned their children long ago. They were raised by their grandmother and starved in the center. They couldn't wean them from carrying bread from the canteen and hiding it under the mattress behind the radiator. This boy has only a grandmother too, wouldn't even send him to school, some kind of sectarian. 
She thought they'd teach him bad things. And Leshka was herding goats in the woods instead of studying. He came to the center as wild as Mowgli. Christina saw these children in the evening, and early in the morning another nanny came to pick them up. But in the evenings, Christina sat with the kids in the playroom and read them books or told them stories. The teachers thought that this would not interest their children. Cartoons, yes. But the guys somehow, somehow instinctively realize that Christina is the same as they have passed the same school of life, speaks the same language, and they flew to her as in a box. Plus, she was a great storyteller. What tormented Christina was that her own children were left unattended at this time. True, John had been well taught to lock the door, check it before bedtime, and not open it for strangers. Still, the neighborhood is far and few things. But the superintendent was so pleased with Christina's work that she allowed her, when there were places in the center to bring the boys in the evening and tuck them in the spare room, and the cook in the kitchen often offered the young woman to take the food in the day room with her. The children here were fed to slaughter and much was left over. About Benjamin Christina knew nothing and had no intention of finding out. She was sure she was doing the right thing and now God was helping her. Yes, she bought going to the hotel with Stephen. But he wasn't married. She hadn't taken him away from anyone and she was already punished for what she had done. Christina was well aware of what she was going through, until the baby she'd been promised at the ultrasound got back on her feet. As for Benjamin, better no father than one like that. Christina will not let him take anything away from her anymore. For her and the children, her former sense of awe and gratitude for what he had once done for her, now vaporized without a trace. Now, Christina was a mother first and foremost, and she took it from there. And then they found her and told her that Benjamin had died in the first minute. She didn't believe it and thought it was a prank. To make up for it. But the man in front of her with his hat in his hand told her everything. Benjamin had enlisted up north after all. And he'd gone as far as he'd ever gone before. As far as Yamal minutes, that's where he caught a cold. Probably went in the same jacket that he used to come to her doctor. Before, as a janitor, he was always given thick coats, nicknames for newcomers. But the ones they had were gone along with the room. And the new Benjamin probably didn't have time to get one or got one before he drank it. Anyway, he got pneumonia, which at first he proudly despised and went to work with a fever. Then he was taken away by ambulance as he was no longer thinking anything and was delirious. A week later, Benjamin died in intensive care guest. Did you ask what to do with the body? They're not officially divorced, so it's up to the wife. How did you find me? Christina asked. It was very difficult along the chain. A few days just hanging on the phone, admitted the man. You could spit on everything and say to bury Benjamin in the city where he died. But would Christina's sons forgive her for that? And she gave almost all the money she earned to bring her husband and very modestly, but buried in the local cemetery. And there was a funeral service, and she brought candy and cakes to the rehab center. At the wake, everything was honored. Now the children would know where their father's grave was. Christina shrugged her shoulders, feeling like a horse, on which an exorbitant burden was put on a donkey. In such a situation would stand up, and cannot stand, and the horse pulls from the last strength and you have to be a donkey, otherwise you'll fall off. And then who to entrust the children to? Christina arranged with the superintendent that her boys would stay at the center while she was in the maternity ward. The girl Molly was born easily. Christina held her daughter in her arms and thought she was the most beautiful of her three children. A porcelain doll with dark eyebrows, eyelashes, and side-drinking hair at the orphanage one girl had a German doll like that, how they all invite her. But it turned out to have the same vice as the rest of the kids, breast milk intolerance. Again, we had to pay for expensive formula. Christina herself was sometimes surprised at how conscious her boys were growing up. The same Christopher is still two tops from the pot, but already ready to look after his sister and change the film and hold the bottle. While the baby eats, 
Christina bought a screen door and created a corner for her and the baby. She tried to keep her daughter at night so that she would not cry and would not disturb the boy's sleep. And the boys were ready to nurse their little sister during the day so that the mother could sleep at least an hour. That's how we had to live, clenching our teeth and work, work, work. Then life would sooner or later get back on track. When Molly went to kindergarten, Christina studied by correspondence and became a teacher, but she didn't want to leave the center. She said that working with troubled children paid more. But that was not the only reason. These kids needed her more than anyone else. When another child was brought to the center, he always cried and dreamed of going home. And the teachers would say the usual words, look how nice it is here, how many toys, and how many friends you will have with whom you will play here. Here's a pie and don't cry. Christina had her own way with everyone. She'd just give them a hug and let them cry. Some she promised to go to their mom and arrange for her to come on Sunday. And no one's children are drawn to her, as it happens, a child from the center. Will he return to his family or send him, God forbid, to an orphanage? But even there, the guys remembered Christina, and they wrote her letters and called her to come visit. And some of them she visited. She was tormented by a feeling of guilt in front of her own children for the fact that they had no father, that they always lived hard and poor. Though Christina remained, as they used to say, of the people, did what she could for them. Looking ahead, once a gypsy guessed Christina that the fate of one of her sons will be such that no one expects, but nothing bad will happen to him, inquired Christina. Though to believe such predictions was at least foolish, no, no, assured the Gypsy. It's just that he's special to you. Give him to us in the Tabor, and we like him that way. But Christina only shook her head fearfully, and since then, she herself began to look closely at the edge. Slightly out of childhood, the boy took an interest in playing the guitar. First, someone in the yard showed him three chords. Then Christina bought her son a cheap instrument for his birthday with which he never parted and extracted from this guitar everything it was capable of. He had much more fanaticism than the kids who were put in music school by their parents and put up with this hard labor in order not to upset their ancestors. And then Christopher fabulously lucky, his buddy, whom rich parents dreamed to see comprehensively developed, so launched music lessons, so by hand led from the specialty of choir and solfeggio that his frustrated and distressed mother gave her son's guitar expensive imported. Frames take my numb skull will no longer take in his hands. The instrument refused decisively. And you have eyes for this case. I can see that. And Christopher is literally gone. Now no trail, no guitar hangout went by without him. Quickly he was picking up from the others. He practiced techniques by day. And by night, he became a true virtuoso. And then he told his mother he was leaving for Street Petersburg. What will you do there? Who is waiting for you there? Christina was confused and frightened. Mom, what kind of life awaits me here? Christopher, please. He also pressed his hand to his chest. It was a gesture she had never seen from him before. I never got to go to music school. And now it's too late. Yes, we have a music school. But without school, I will not get there. And apart from music, I'm not interested in anything else in life. But I'll have to learn something, get a profession. I'll have to feed myself. So, I hate engineering. Economics too. I'll just ruin my life. If I stay here, we'll let you go. And Christina gave up. She just said, guiltily. But everything is so expensive there. And I can't feed you and support you in another city. You know, you don't need anything. Mom, I'll do it myself. Don't worry about me. And don't be sad that we're splitting up. I'll keep coming back. He went to Peter and for six months sent only short messages that he was alive and well, and everything was fine. Yeah, he called a couple times, asking about the family. And then Christopher came for a few days and his family found out that he was now playing in the band and they were carrying him in their arms. The band is getting more and more popular. There were concerts ahead, touring, 
Since that time, the novel appeared at home once twice a year. He became famous with the musicians. He toured a lot. He was already known abroad. He would visit, and Christina felt indignantly that her son had become a different stranger to her. Their family simple news was far from him, and the things he told were not at all about the world in which they lived. Christopher was bringing in money that seemed to Christina to be enormous. She refused for a long time, and when he still insisted on his own, his mother took the bills, so that on the very next day, she could quietly put them into the account, which was opened in her son's name by a secret from him. She believed that while she was on her feet she had no right to use her son's money, and Christopher can make his fabulous earnings unreliable, and not forever. And the day will come when he'll be penniless. That's when she'll give him the savings account. Sometimes Christina timidly asked the novelist if he had a girlfriend and if he was going to get married. I do not insist, my son, I am not one of those to whom you do not put grandchildren. I'd just like to know, to be happy for you. If anything, you'll tell me. I'll tell mom. If there's something to say. There's plenty of girls out there. But there's nothing serious in my life, except music. And both mother and son smiled sadly. In this, Christopher was in the rhythm of a one lover who has not yet met the one who will be the only one for him all his life. Eldest son John was quite different. Christina had always viewed him as her right-hand man. He babysat his little sister too, and didn't shy away from doing women's work. Acquaintances invite Christina, you haven't helped with the floors, and will cook dinner. Where do they get such golden boys? I'll tell you a secret. I got a gift version. Christina was joking around, but the truth is, her heart ached for John all the time. He always thought of others first, and then himself. And today, I guess he couldn't do that. When they went somewhere on the bus, Christina never remembered her son sitting for long. He always found someone to give up his seat. If not an old lady, then a middle-aged woman or even a girl. At school, it was John who the teachers often asked for help. He was unflappable. How will you go to the army? Christina was worried. Everyone will ride you there, and not just those grandfathers. You'll call everyone to lend a shoulder. What fool wouldn't take advantage of that? She remembered the orphanage life too well. If your father didn't know how to stand up for himself, she told her son, we'd both be lost. He protected himself and me. You realize that even goodness must have its fists. I go to the boxing gym, John smiled. It's not enough. There must be somewhere inside you the ability to fight back. If you get hurt, Christina saw her son off to the army. For good, no farewell table, no drinking with relatives. The mother just hung on John's chest and sobbed. Raised such a good, kind, strong man. Would he come back? or would he be broken there? He came back and suddenly announced to Christina that he was going to law school part-time and was going to work for the police. You can imagine, he did. He soon calls us a family, a mom and two daughters. They live in a private house and here comes a homeless guy. He just saw that the gate was not on the fence and came in, sat down in their hallway and said that he wanted to eat and would not leave until he was fed. So they fed him. He said that he liked it here, and he would stay and so, and so they persuaded him. But he wouldn't. Sits there like a king demanding tea. That's when they got on the phone. And when we arrived with the guys and took this young man under our arms, how grateful these poor people were to us. They almost bowed at our feet. They wouldn't have had the strength to cope with him. And then John was sent to Chechnya simply as a policeman to work for a few months. He went without any desire to leave his mother and sister, and he always thought that his place was in his hometown. And since then he had been in touch with them for several months. He's been very sparing with his family. Short calls, half-page letters. And in March Christina got a call that his son was lying in a military hospital. It happens, even though there doesn't seem to be a war. Whoever mutilated her son was never found. Christina forgot everything then, threw on a t-shirt that she wore as a teenager, sat by John's bedside in the ward, 
he was considered almost hopeless. For several months, the fever did not go down. She had no strength not only to get up, not even to sit up in bed. The doctors tried to prepare Christina for the fact that she would lose her son, but without raising her eyes, she stood in the corridor to get plates of hospital lunch, returned to the ward again, fed John from a spoon, did the laundry, did the dirtiest job of a nurse. She also cleaned up after other patients, even though she was so small and thin. She did everything so they wouldn't send her away. They left her here to be a son, and she got what she wanted. John started to get up, started to walk, but he was going to limp for the rest of his life. The fractures were very difficult. But Christina realized she had pulled her son through. For a while, they didn't talk about the future. What would John's health be like from now on? Would he have to be on disability, or would he be able to work as a police officer again? Both were silent on the subject, but Christina noticed that her son had changed a lot. His expression became withdrawn and rigid, as John had never been before, and the son was silent almost all the time, did not read, although before he was a real book to swallow. Now he lay more and more with his hands behind his head, immersed in himself, thinking. Well, finally, at last, Christina began to talk. We'll be going home soon. You'll be discharged next week. You're glad. And then John told her gently, I'm going home. If I go home, it won't be for long. Where do you think you're going? She shrieked involuntarily. You could almost hear the desperation in her voice. After all, I also want to leave me, like Christopher. In the shower, had she hoped that it was with John that she would live out her life, that her son would forever be her support? No, she would never hang on his neck, would never stop her from arranging her own life. It was just that she had never been afraid around him. She wouldn't be afraid of not incoming old age or disease. John was the kind of man she wanted to have by her side. That being said, Christina swore to herself that no matter who John married, she would not say a word. She would step aside, would not interfere with the young, but on the contrary, would help them in every way she could. Christina never thought that her son would ever leave her. And now he spoke of it himself. Where are you going to Moscow or Peter, like Christopher? No, Mom. There's a line from an old poem. I want silence. You must have burned your nerves. After what I saw out there, I want to be alone for a while. I got in touch with one of my friends. He's calling me to be a forest ranger. What are you going to do with a broken leg in a job like that? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. John smiled, trying to distract his mother. Now I will go home anyway. I will recover. And then we'll see. Kristina fervently began to convince her son that he would not be out of work if he did not have to return to the police. You can go to school, for example. A teacher of labor. John has a law degree. If his leg won't allow him to walk much, he can find a sedentary job in a court or in a private office, as a lawyer's assistant to a notary. John stroked her arm affectionately but said neither yes nor no. And Christina realized with despair that it seemed that he had already decided everything for himself in his heart. That was a quality that could not be taken away from him. If anything, the subject was wrong in his head. You just do not hurry, she begged her son. Stand up first. Maybe not only the leg, but also your nerves under the stomach. He left after three months. John did not understand anything about the business he was to do, but was full of desire to learn. He was given a house not even on the outskirts of the village, but as if separate from everyone else. You had to walk to the outskirts, an old house and two birch trees. Since then, Christina came to visit her son together with his mother, and once at the girl's request she left her here for the whole summer. Yes, it was probably the best place to settle her nerves. Silence, just the sound of leaves. Not far from the gate, two white goats grazed in the meadow. A rooster was keeping an eye on the hens, and on three sides of the road the forest was noisy. Christina saw that her son was changing for the better. He got a real tan, became stronger, began to joke sometimes, and sometimes seemed quite the same. And yet there was a break in him. Christina realized this when she saw her son, in the middle of a lively conversation, 
can suddenly fall silent again and go into his own unhappy thoughts, even if only briefly for a few moments. And he did get a local girl, and it looked like they were getting married. At least Christina could rest easy about that. The youngest daughter, Molly, turned out to be another gift of fate rarely pretty. Outwardly, she was not like her brothers or her mother. Polly Clinic, and on the playgrounds at school and ballet studio girl admired. But she looked like a doll. That's a phrase that stuck with her mom. She was also an excellent student, and Christina didn't have to go through what she went through with her older children. When the parents of other children hinted to their children that it would not be worth it to get too close to the kids from a dysfunctional family, where the father drinks and the mother, though a hard worker, but from orphanages from such good do not expect good. Molly had many girlfriends, and everything in her life seemed to go smoothly. Her brothers spoiled her. Especially the eldest John constantly made her sister some gifts. Always sticking up for her, if in the evening she was late for classes in the club or performed on stage, he'd meet her and walk her home. Molly was slow to contact fans, spent her evenings at home. She sewed her own costumes for dance numbers. She inherited her golden hands. True, she was good at women's crafts. She sewed, embroidered, knitted. She graduated from school with a medal, but she chose her profession more than reasonably. I like to do ballet, but I have no special abilities, she told her mother. And in this field, I will not achieve anything. I'd rather go to college and try to find a job that would make me happy and feed me. Christopher's brother called her to Peter. He rented a good apartment there and promised that she could live with him as long as she wanted. And even if she didn't get in, would it be a bad thing? To visit the northern capital, and he'll show her around. What about your love life? Molly asked jokingly. Christopher shrugged. It's a two-bedroom apartment. One room I'll allocate you, and I'll do without a bedroom and a music studio. But Molly did not accept the invitation and entered the institute in his city. She passed the competition bar easily. Mother did not even have to be nervous. However, it so happened that ties with former friends were interrupted. After school, everyone scattered as if from a gust of wind. Many girls chose large cities in the university that chose Molly, did not enter none, but long alone to stay youth cannot. And Molly had a friend for the first time. And it was a friend and nothing else. The guy was 10 years older than her. He was fat as fuck and had a funny last name, Little. He was a mama's boy, but in a good way. Just felt sorry for his elderly feeble health, mom, even though she was a terrible bore. But Little got home on time every night, so that mom wouldn't worry. And he was home for both daughter and son, scrubbing floors and chopping. Feeding two Persian cats, my mother's favorite. My brother helped mom all the time too, Molly Little said when she got to know him a little better. That's where their betrayal began, and Molly saw Sergei exactly as an older brother. They sat together in classes and went out together in the institute canteen in the evenings. If we had free time and talked about everything in the world, we liked being friends with the MAI guy even more than with the girls. In their conversations there was no place for idle gossip. He read a lot had a good sense of humor. They often joked with each other. Molly thought that this relationship would last forever. But then everything changed. Sergi's mother died, and immediately, as if from under the ground, a certain girl came out of the ground, who clung to Little with a dead grip. Literally, when she was near Sergi, her hand was worn under his elbow. Castle, where did you find her? Molly asked. They were sitting in lectures. Only at the Institute Little was getting freedom from Miss Lena. She worked as a saleswoman in a sporting goods store and looked at Molly with suspicion and almost with hatred. After all, Molly sat half the day in the Institute Auditorium next to her Sergi. Little shrugged guiltily. Yes, it just happened. She started talking to me on the street. I said, but that's all. She's been my shadow ever since. Molly. She didn't want to believe it would last. She thought Little would be smart enough to stand up for his own freedom. But before he knew it, he was married. And after that, he was finally caught in the grip of the law. 
Sergi's apartment was sold because Lena found it impossible to cramped and the neighborhood is bad. And now to read little was no time all thoughts and forces about earning and paying the mortgage on time. With Molly he could now only meet by chance and chat for a few minutes. Left alone the girl began to wonder if she had made a mistake. No, it wasn't about her own failure to wrap her head around Christopher as her boyfriend. She'd never really accepted him. But now that she had Molly's degree, she wondered if she was in the right business. Her soul asked for romance. But at work it was numbers, reports, graphs, tables. And so from morning till night. True, the pay was good in the firm where she got a good job. And my friends immediately found my hairdresser that don't go to an expensive salon. Go to Vanessa, who Molly I was even confused. To Vanessa she works at home, but she's a real pro will make you a human being. Finally realizing that she had to be more decisive, one of the mutual acquaintances simply led her to this very Vanessa by the hand. Vanessa turned out to be a very pretty damsel, about 28 years old. Molly had always distrusted hairdressers. If they couldn't style their own hair and wore the hell out of it, Vanessa looked like a model, a waterfall of flawless blonde hair flowing down her shoulders, makeup, a work of art. At home, a pile of colors, jars, a tube of hair masks and face masks, scissors, 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 scissors. What's a hairdresser's shop? And Vanessa managed to keep up with her young daughter. When she looked at Molly, she rounded her eyes and asked who did that to you. What are you talking about? I don't get it, girl. Vanessa picked up her hair. Damn, she'd recently dyed her hair that color and tried it herself. The light shone over her forehead. Vanessa fiddled with it all day, treated her hair with some imported products, recolored it, suffered from the grove, the end styled my naturally outstanding hair into a hairstyle. For a long time, she did makeup, selecting shades with the thoroughness of an artist a perfectionist. When Vanessa allowed me to look in the mirror, Molly didn't recognize herself. Sitting there was a beauty who had nothing to do with her. Molly, you little office rat, I could put this one on the catwalk right now. After that Molly, I started coming to Vanessa's. At least once a month. Make an appointment. The hairdresser's schedule was so busy. What about a pop star? My little daughter played in the manage. From time to time her mother threw her new toys. Vanessa saw her husband once or twice. He worked as a remote programmer. He earned God and willing and didn't give the family a penny. Lost all his money. Luck never turned his way once, but he never gave up trying to please this capricious lady. In the meantime, Vanessa kept the family together. Why didn't she try to free herself? Didn't shake off her husband like ballast that kept her from sailing on the sea of life. At ease, that's what she couldn't understand as if there was in Vanessa something from an oriental woman, who a priori believes that the man is superior and he must be obeyed. And now Molly could not look at the blonde beauty without a slight feeling of pity. She herself constantly caught admiring glances. Sometimes she turned around, and it was pleasant. And no one knew that in the evenings she lay behind her screen and read fairy tales. Yes, rereading her children's books and dreaming of falling in love just like the little mermaid. One day her mother came into her cubbyhole. She sat on the edge of the bed, stroked her shoulder, which was rare. Christina didn't usually have time for affection. I loved fairy tales when I was a child, too, her mother said. You did. Molly was surprised. She had never seen her mother with a book in her hands. Really, Christina nodded. In the orphanage sometimes, there were such moments that I wanted to kill myself only with fairy tales and save myself. You're dreaming. The fact that the Chief Stephen is looking after her. Molly, despite her lack of experience, realized quickly. Even a blind woman would have guessed it. Once, when the girl came into his office with papers, he offered her a glass of champagne. It was so unexpected that Molly stared at him as in that folk saying of leprosy and new gates. Then he invited her to a concert. She said that she was not musical and did not like modern pop at all. What do you like? In his voice, he felt genuine interest. 
Reading alone, Molly said. Here the topic was already difficult to continue the chief had to nod at it and go about his business. But the new colleagues insisted that the boss will not leave the girl alone. I don't like him. Molly fought back. Come on. He's handsome. One of the girls persuaded her. But there's something missing in him. Some kind of masculinity. But he's got an ending. Pardon the vulgarity. And nobody's trying to convince you to marry him. He won't offer you one. It'll be quiet. But why not let yourself have some fun? Maybe he's taking you to Italy. He took Masha to Italy. Molly got off with a laugh. She was going to the corporate party quite calmly, not even assuming that something extraordinary could happen. She anticipated only a delicious dinner, music, and the opportunity to dance in the cafe. Molly was extremely rare. Not the right upbringing. This was supposed to be simple. It'd be an intimate gathering at work. You could stay late. And since everyone would be a little drunk, the girls would call a cab to take them home. And then there were cocktails, which I'd never had before. Surprisingly delicious, except they made me dizzy and lost my sense of reality. And when they were followed by Cognac in the chief's office, now I wanted to cry. Why did everything happen so banal, like in a cheap love story? Only there the chief and the gray mouse, his subordinates, in the end, necessarily fall in love with each other, and she gives birth to his son and even a double or even a triple. Molly, I was thinking about the fact that if she goes to work after the holidays, it will be only to write a letter of resignation. She'll never be able to see Stephen as a man. Some kind of vibe he lacks. And even if he built her a palace and sent her around the world in a ship, it wouldn't make things right. When her work came for her unexpectedly, Molly's mother felt immensely guilty. She knew how much of the three Christina's nerves were already on edge and how important it was to her that her daughter be home on time. Frosty outside, said Christina, and you are hyped up. Let's call a cab. That was a rarity, too. It wasn't that Christina didn't like spending money on cabs. She realized it was out of her hands. It wasn't hers. It was a way of life. To this day, every penny counts. One could take the bus to get there or walk. To Molly's amazement, the chief didn't leave. Stephen stood by like a lost man. I'll take you home, he said hastily. And even more astonished was the girl. When her mother simply replied, don't. Stephen, you've been drinking. I can smell it a mile away. We'll get there ourselves. Come on, Molly. Stephen didn't sleep that night. At first, he couldn't believe he'd met Christina again after she'd vanished without a trace all those years ago. It really was like a stone in the water, and he never meant to hurt her. He knew how hard her life was. He sneaked her all the money he had in his purse. He knew she wouldn't take it out of his hand. Maybe she'd find it. She wouldn't be angry right away. Of course, he'd say she wasn't a beggar, but suddenly he'd get angry and keep it for himself, for sure she had so many needs. He would be ready to help her even then. But it had never occurred to him to propose to her. A whole life already stood between them. Stephen had become a hardened bachelor at heart. The thought of marriage terrified him. He was more than satisfied with the woman who ran his household. Paid, and everything will be done the way he wants. Tired of it, he fired her. And the kids. There's no telling if they would have accepted him or not. Boys are at difficult age, and the sons, God forbid his temper comes out in them. Then it would be impossible to deal with them at all. And then Stephen challenged the idea that it was the girl he liked so much and who was now his mistress. Maybe his daughter, even if he and Christina had only one night together. But what the hell was the joke? He began to frantically remember how many years ago this meeting had taken place, how many years of MAI and covered himself in cold sweat. Christina herself, well-worn by life, looked now about 20 years older than him. But Molly was pretty. Does she look like him or Benjamin? Christina knows, of course, who her father is. But if the irreparable has happened, what is to be done? So far, Stephen has been treated like a table on which there were an inconceivable number of dishes, and the only thing left to do was to choose. Should he not try this one more? He was trying it. 
New resort, new club, new entertainment, new girls. And now, for the first time in his life, he was scared. Usually when he had a problem, he called his therapist. It was in step with the times, Stephen. And it wouldn't have occurred to you to get alcohol or cry to your friends. No, they're not stupid in the West. There, every well-to-do man goes to his own doctor. The therapist's name was Artur Igorovich. He was the most fashionable in town and expensive. A consultation with him cost a fortune. He was also famous as a dog sled traveler, and that added to his popularity. Women flowed to him, even though at heart he was. Jean Hader. And Stephen was impressed by that. At one time, when he told the doctor his story, he blamed Christina for everything and justified the actions of his patient. In addition, he never once said that Stephen should have gotten married. In the therapist's opinion, his client would be happy just by remaining single. But what will he say this time? Can such a criminal mistake be justified? Or was there no mistake at all? Just a pretty despicable act. He took advantage of the inadequacy of a girl who was drunk for the first time and through his own fault. No, he's gonna have to drink it himself. He'd pick up the phone at 500, then at six o'clock. He wanted to call Christina, but realized it was obscenely early. Had he and his daughter even slept that night? What and how had she told her mother? Stephen was holding his head, and at times as heavy as a bear. For the first time in many long years, he remembered the orphanage in his life so vividly. He was ashamed in front of the dead Benjamin. And in front of Christina and her daughter, he couldn't even say what he'd experienced. In the morning, Christina called himself. He saw an unfamiliar number on his cell phone and immediately guessed who it was. Yes, he said, and didn't recognize his voice. He coughed and repeated it. Yes, we need to talk, Christina said. But at any rate, he's not such a coward as to avoid this meeting. When and where? He asked. Apparently, she thought for a few minutes, because he hastily suggested. At my work is not worth it, all the same will interfere. But there is a good cafe opposite the office. No, said Christina. And he literally saw her hard grin. I don't want to go to the cafe with you. I'll give you the address. Come to our house and we'll talk. He got the idea that she wanted him to show up as a groom, honor with flowers, and propose. Life had put her through its millstones, but Christina still remained a storyteller. My home would be gone, Christina said. She's gone to a friend's house, but come in the morning. Then I'll leave too. I'll get ready, and Christina hung up. Less than an hour had passed, and he was already outside her house. He didn't remember having been in this neighborhood before. There were old five-story buildings shy of the dirty courtyard. Of course, no intercom. So Stephen immediately rang the bell at the very door of the apartment on the third floor. In the semi-darkness of the corridor, Christina seemed to him the same. The same small figure, the same dark hair lying on her shoulders. He handed her a luxurious bouquet of white and pink roses. Such gives to favored girls, they put them in a bucket, not in a vase. Come in, Christina said. She did put the flowers in a bucket. Probably, there were not so many vases in the house to divide them into bouquets, and the skeptical simplicity of a small apartment. And behind the screen door, Stephen's mom's bed must have gotten even grosser on her soul. Christina pointed him to the sofa herself sat opposite, straight, stern. She didn't offer tea or coffee. Christina. He mustered up the courage not to go around. Yes, around. You, I think you've told mine. And I think you know what happened yesterday. She nodded and said nothing more. She didn't come at him with reproach. I was terribly guilty and I wanted to make my proposal to ask her to marry me. Marry her she won't regret. I'll do anything to make sure she won't regret it. She'll have everything I can give her. Christina shook her head slowly. Or did he take his hand to his throat? Did he want to help himself to talk? Or is she my daughter? At one time, I didn't know whose daughter she was, Christina said. But when Benjamin died, I pulled myself together and did the test. And she's Molly. 
Stephen dropped his head to his chest. He could finally breathe. She won't marry you, Christina also said dryly. I'm sorry, Stephen. And rich, and you have a firm and a business. You own factories, newspapers, steamships. But there's just something about you. I couldn't love you. And mine won't either. And you can't really love her. You can't love anyone but yourself. But I ruined her life. Stephen didn't try to get out of it. I could have tried to redeem myself somehow. Isn't that a lot of honor to take on? The last thing he expected was to hear Christina say those words. She'll forget what happened sooner or later. But if she gets involved with you and gives you a piece of her life to run away on a soap heel, yeah, she learned a lesson, albeit a hard one. But it's just a lesson. It's not a tragedy. So what do you want me to do for her? Stephen asked, and then he added, And for you too. You realize that she will leave your firm now, Christina said. The girl has no connections. It will be hard for her, if you help her, not because of what you did, but in memory of our former friendship. You remember how we were friends with Benjamin, all three of us. That's probably fair. You know, third hand somehow, and she won't take you. Did you tell Molly about us? He asked. Christina nodded. Yes, she and I have always been and will always be honest with each other. It's not easy for her right now, but she'll recover. She may look weak, but she is strong. What can you do for me? Take me to the train station. You're leaving. Fear has awakened in him again. Of what? Of me. Where are you going? To the train station, Christina repeated. It leaves in an hour and a half. Just then, he noticed a wheeled bag in the corner. Let's go, he said, standing up. The car is downstairs. On the way, he tried to ask her about how she had lived all these years, about her children. I'm sorry, Christina said. The subject is closed to our lives. I don't want to let you in. For a few minutes, they drove in silence. And I take it you're still single. Christina was staring at herself and it looks like I'm not going to have anything serious in my life. Christina, I will not ask you about yours, but you have always been great, as it is said, about the soul of the soul and poison. She interjected, having heard it more than once. You always knew what was in everyone's soul. I could predict what was going to happen next. Tell me, please, am I going to be alone in life like this? What do they say about women? A celibate veil. Am I wearing a crown or something? Why is my love life not working out? He asked, but he kind of knew her answer. Now she would say, because you don't need anyone yourself. Can you get married? Said Christina tiredly. Just don't be under any illusions that you'll be loved. If you openly see that a girl is attracted to your money, marry the one you want. But why such a girl? Because only soulmates make a good family. Christina shrugged. If you want someone to look over you in your old age, make a marriage contract and live with your eyes open. You and your spouse have a business arrangement. You her youth, beauty full of obedience, like in the East. And for her, a life of luxury while you're alive and a bank account. After you're dead, Majorca was 100 times worse than me. Did you love him? Who told you he was worse? Yes, he drank himself to death, but he knew how to love when he was young. And you don't have that in you. Absolutely. That's how people don't have the gift of music or can't draw. You can't fight it. You can't make it work. When they arrived at the station for train three, they were already boarding. Where are you going? Once again, he asked, already not hoping that she would answer him. But Christina answered to her eldest son to John's apartment leaving Molly behind. If she wants to, she'll stay in town. If she wants to, she'll move. I've never stood in the way of my children. And he needs me now. I can feel it in my heart. He's out in the middle of nowhere. I have to take a train, then a train, then a bus. John works as a forester. He lives in a cabin with no facilities. That doesn't scare me. We've been there, but we need to warm our hearts right now. He and me, and me and him. Did he call you? 
No, he won't. I can just feel it. I told you, you called me. How's that for a soul? Christina climbed up on the step of the carriage. Stephen helped her lift her bag. She nodded and went straight inside. The train had already pulled away from the platform, and Stephen followed it. For some reason, he waited for Christina to come out into the vestibule, and they would look at each other, and the snow would fly, covering her black hair and white, similar shawl.